My hope is through my program, you will get tools to take home with you to improve your physical health, your emotional health, and your spiritual health. Because ultimately, it, it, what is the most uh, important um, aspect here? We are at Shivananda Ashram, right? We just had a Gita par, uh, Parayana. Um, and what's the, what's the ultimate goal of all of us, right? Sachit Ananda. Maybe in this lifetime, maybe in another thousand lifetimes, but at least we want to start on our uh, ladder, start our journey on the ladder to spiritual enlightenment. So today is an Ayurveda intro appetizer, and tomorrow at the workshop is the main course, right? Because we're going to have much more time. So we're going to dip our toes into the basic concepts of Ayurveda, right? The elements, the doshas that make up uh, what we call our unique constitution in Ayurveda. Tomorrow we'll do a deep dive into the doshas. So we'll touch upon them today. Um, but tomorrow we'll have a much more interactive sessions. Uh, some people have already come up to me and asked me some questions uh, about, uh, you know, is coffee good for me or things like that. So we'll address some of your questions as well tomorrow. Um, then tomorrow night satsang is going to be about the causes of disease. And that's going to be followed up with an Ayurveda nutrition workshop, where we'll talk about the importance of digestion and Ayurveda nutrition from a constitutional perspective. My third and final satsang is going to be about prana, tejas, and ojas. The ultimate goal of Ayurveda is to build ojas, to build immunity, so that you have that container to continue your path to moksha, or self-realization. And my final workshop is going to be an afternoon of Tantra. Tantra gives us tools, rituals, pujas, chanting, mantras are all part of Tantra. So we are going to be using mantras, mudras, like Anjali Mudra. We have specific mudras for each chakras. And then we're going to wrap it up with a chakra meditation. So does that, does that sound like a good program? OK. Covered lots of bases. OK. So let's talk about um, Ayurveda. Uh, people ask, you know, is there clinical research? Is this clinical trial behind this, behind that? Well, it's been, it's been around for about 5,000 or even 6,000 years. OK, so it's been around because it works. OK, uh, it's ancient. Um, Ayurveda and yoga came about at the same time um, in ancient India. Okay, references can be found in the Vedas, which are the oldest uh, scriptures known to mankind, right? Okay, and the, according to the World Health Organization, it is the oldest form of healthcare in the world. Now, if you were to ask me, you know, why isn't, uh, how many of you have been to India? Okay, is Ayurveda and yoga practiced everywhere in India? Uh, no, not much, right? Because India for two millennia, two centuries, were ruled by some form of rulers, be it the Turks or the Mughals or the British, right? So that's when like Ayurveda went underground, right? Uh, India is so ancient, right? But it was practiced in certain families, but the main system of medicine became Yunani, or then became Western medicine, right? So now Ayurveda is making a huge resurgence in India because it's more popular in the West and whatever is popular in the West becomes popular in the East. So the West borrowed it, borrowed yoga and Ayurveda from India, but because it's so popular in the West, it's more popular in the East. So every time I go home, I see another yoga studio, I see more Ayurveda programs, more Ayurveda resorts, but I also see more KFCs and McDonald's. So, you know, it's like it works both ways, right? So, okay. Um, you know, in India, we have a god for everything. And these gods and goddesses are basically archetypes, right? So we have this amazing Lord Dhanvantri. Dhanvantri is the god of Ayurveda. He resides within us, okay? When I started, I was hospitalized with pneumonia. It was pretty serious, and that was my true wake-up call, even though my roots are Ayurveda. That's when I realized Western medicine has its limitations. So I started working with an Ayurveda practitioner. And what an Ayurveda practitioner does is they're just the facilitator. I'm just the facilitator. 
based on her recommendations, based on my constitution and my symptoms, she, she gave me recommendations that I put into practice, right? So when I work with a client, they walk the walk, I just talk the talk. When you walk the walk, you awaken the inner healer, Lord Danvantri within you, and amazing things happen. Shift starts happening, right? Okay. Um, again, you can get a PhD in Indian DT iconography, right? So the, you see gods and goddesses with a discus. That represents like severing of the ego, right? Severing of the maya or illusion that we are separate, right? We all want to get to that um, aham brahmasmi. We're talking about Brahman, right? That's, that's the altar. That's what we're all striving for, right? No separateness, no, no separation, right? Um, then you see him having amrit. That's Amrit, like, you know, a beautiful golden pot. That's Amrit, nectar of immortality. On, uh, uh, in one other one of his um, hands, he's holding a beautiful plant. It's supposed to be Brahmi. Brahma means consciousness. Brahmi plant, that which awakens consciousness. Okay? So here we are um, in, a, in a place that, um, you know, teaches yoga, right? So what is the connection between Ayurveda and yoga? So David Frawley, who's an amazing Vedic scholar, uh, I'm, I'm sure he's been here many times, right? Um, his books are wonderful on yoga and Ayurveda. Uh, he has a new book out, uh, it's not, it's fairly new, it's called Soma, which is amazing. So he says this perfectly. So first of all, Ayurveda and yoga are two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same coin, okay? Ayurveda is self-healing and yoga is self-realization, right? We need both those tools, right, to achieve health. Health, not just for the sake of health, you know, just some people, for them, that's good enough. That's okay. But we want to use as a health, as an enabler to pursue moksha, okay, to, again, continue our journey on this ladder of self-enlightenment, okay? Point number three, Ayurveda and yoga combine to lead us on the path of perfect harmony and optimal health so that we can reconnect to our true nature as spirit or divine consciousness, right? Aham Brahmasmi, right? That is the loftier goal of Ayurveda and yoga, right? So I tell people, right, to go to yoga classes and uh, for the physical benefits, it's like, you know, having the icing on the cake. You leave the entire cake behind, right? So same thing if you pursue Ayurveda just for physical health, uh, it's, you're not getting the, the whole thing, the whole thing, right? So much, it promises you so much more than just health on a physical level, right? There are many different uh, definitions of Ayurveda I'm going to um, talk through this evening, okay? Um, this is one from Charaka Samhita. Charaka was one of the pioneers one of the original teachers of Ayurveda, and he has a six-volume book called Charaka Samhita, okay? He says, health is the best foundation to pursue the four pursuits in life, which are what? Dharma, Artha, right? So Dharma is how we make our living, okay? Artha is providing for ourselves and our family. Kama, you know, worldly pleasures, be it food, be it art, be it sensual pleasures, right? And finally, leading to moksha, right? Which is liberation from this uh, cycle of death and birth, right? Without health, we will not be able to pursue these four pursuits. Does that make sense, right? If you're not healthy, again, you're not... You know, you, you know, you may be sick, you may be bedridden, you may have aches and pains. Moksha may be the last thing on your mind, right? Although we've had realized masters for whom pain didn't stop them from attaining moksha, but we are mere mortals, right? So, dharma artha kama mokshanam arogyam mulam uttamam. This is what I love about Sanskrit. So what can be said in like one line? takes like five lines in English, the translation, right? So it's very succinct. Um, dharma, Artha, Kama, Mokshanam. You understand that? Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Arogyam. Arogyam means health. In fact, we have a brand, in mil brand of milk in India. It's called Arogya. You know, health. Health providing milk. 
ஓகே மூலம் ஆஃப் பிராயம் உத்தமம் இம்பார்ட்டன்ஸ் ஐ ஸோ தர்ம அர்த்த காம மோக்ஷனம் ஆரோக்கியம் மூலம் உத்தமம் ஓகே கேன் எவ்ரிபடி ஹியர் மீ பாய் த வே யா யூ பேக் தேர் பர்ஃபெக்ட் ஓகே So what is Ayurveda? I've been defined Ayurveda for you, right? Ayurveda is a beautiful word. Ayur or Ayus means life. Veda means science. Vedas, ancient books of knowledge. Knowledge, wisdom, right? So Ayurveda is the wisdom of life and longevity or science of life and longevity. Okay? It's the heart of living in harmony with the laws of nature. right so not just in harmony with our constitution tomorrow we're going to talk about it doshas govern not just our constitution times of the day the seasons the life span right so we want to rise with the sun or much before the sun like we spoke about today a brahma muhurta and we'll get to the elements of ayurveda and i'll touch upon you know from an ayurvedic perspective why that time is so conducive for meditation right so Ayurveda is a complete medical science. It's great at preventing disease. In fact, I think it's the only system of medicine that helps do that. Honestly, 60% of clients who come to see me come for that. They want to know what their constitution is and get a five sense therapy protocol. We'll talk about five sense therapies to live optimally for the rest of their life, right? So Ayurveda excels in that, gives us tools for that. But it's also a it's also great at healing diseases and imbalances right depending on the severity of the imbalance digestive issues issues of the mind like anxiety worry gas bloating constipation ayurveda shines ayurveda gives you tools for diet and lifestyle right to basically address the root cause not just the symptoms when you address root cause symptoms go away in more severe cases like parkinsons or fibromyalgia or multiple sclerosis or some forms of cancer um we have this theory it takes a village so ayurveda will be a complementary and adjunct therapy right but it again gives so many tools in terms of diet and lifestyle okay it takes a village yeah so like for instance i have um, a lady with rheumatoid arthritis so she comes to me for ayurveda diet lifestyle customized massage abhyanga oil for massage and all that but she sees an integrative md to make sure he checks her c reactive protein make sure inflammation markers are down she works with an acupuncturist and because she's in so much pain uh, working out in the water helps a lot so she works with a physical therapist so some that's what i meant sometimes it takes a village and ayurveda is a very important part of that village um so this is where i like to get a little interactive so what is your definition of health this is the western definition of health state of being free from illness or injury what does health mean to you anybody vitality excellent what else feeling good excellent i heard someone else wellness very good yeah yeah so it's not just a state of being free from illness or injury that's the western definition that's what will happen when you pick up a webster dictionary right so state of being free from illness or injury ayurveda i'm going to get to a much bigger definition of health in ayurveda i already showed you the definition from charaka which says that is the def- that is health is the foundation for dharma artha kama moksha to pursue those four pursuits of life right swastha is the word for health in ayurveda swastha can any everybody say that swastha swastha swa meaning self stha means established in okay true health is when we are connected to our true nature as divine spirit that's the ultimate definition of health okay so in ayurveda you know this is not just physical medicine right in fact we we'll talk about it in um 
when we talk about prana tejas ojas uh, we exist on three levels physical physical level energetic level which is where we have the chakras and the nadis right the pranayama and the chakra meditation help us uh, you know help our emotional body then we have the causal or karmic body the reason we have been born in this lifetime as well right okay so again ayurveda is about health for all those levels right so swastha two kinds of selves one is self with the small letter s which is our ego okay we need healthy self esteem to take care of ourselves okay fine we do need a little bit of you know connection with that ego for that purpose but the more important self is the self with the capital letter s which is our spiritual self the more we are connected to our spiritual self the more we move on our path towards perfect health in ayurveda does that make sense because what happens when we are connected to the ego so i'm going to i said five sense therapies right so we take in the world through our five senses right sense of taste sense of smell sense of sight sense of sound sense of touch so what happens if we are truly aligned with the ego what what how are we going to are we going to create disease or are we going to create harmony right we, when we are aligned with our ego we take in things that are disharmonious to us right so sense of taste oh i feel like having a chocolate cake or i want to have a burger right it's all about sense gratification um you know not being mindful of the chemicals that you buy you know whether it's to use on you or to wash your clothes or wash your dishes right so that's a sense of smell instead of you saying you know um scents like essential oils that come from the plant world the natural world right again sense of taste you know eating organic high prana vegetarian vegan food like we are you know being fed here at the ashram right sense of sight when you're connected to the ego it's about sense gratification it's about watching that show or um you know watching news these days uh, it's so rajasic right um and then maybe watching video games right versus um you know spending time in nature looking at the blue of the ocean you know doing tratakam candle gazing um you know focusing on uh, colors that are good for your dosha right so that creates health sense of sound you listen to mantras you listen to music satsang right that's all going to create health that happens when you're connected to your divine self but what happens when you're connected to the ego it's about you know listening to music that doesn't serve you listening to gossip right okay listening to talk radio right so rajasay we're going to talk about sattva rajas tamas but most of you know what what they are i suppose the gunas right but rajas is vrittis turbulence in the mind right takes you away from god okay and sense of touch once again using harsh chemicals wearing um you know um a natural clothing uh tight fitting clothing um so you know using essential oils and natural oils as your main um you know um what do you say like you know body care products and not chemical laden products that's way that loving yourself um you know that's the way you honor you yourself through the sense of touch does that make sense ego versus um yeah good okay ego versus divine self so now here is the most complete definition of health according to Sushrutta who is again another amazing amazing father of ayurveda in fact father of modern surgery so sushrutta samhita which is his treatise on surgery actually has implements or surgical tools which are thought to be precursors to modern day surgical implements you see ayurveda was very very advanced for its day and age okay I love this definition. I love the Sanskrit even more. But this is health. So we just saw what was the best what was the western definition of health? Free of illness or injury, right? Absence of illness and inj- or injury, right? According to Ayurveda, it is the one who's established in self. Uh, that's the paramount protocol, most important protocol for health. Established in divine self, right? Who has balanced doshas? 
who has balanced Agni, digestive fire. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at doshas today. We're going to look at Agni tomorrow. Properly formed dhatus. If you're digesting well, you'll have properly formed tissues. Proper elimination of malas, base products. Those are urine, feces, and sweat. Okay? Properly functioning bodily processes. And whose mind, soul, and senses are full of bliss. This person is called a healthy person. So as you see how much more holistic it is, right? Okay. So in Sanskrit, it goes something like this. Samadosha, sama agnishcha, samadhatu, malakriyaha, prasanna atma, indriya, manaha, swasta, iti abhidyatet. Samadosha. Balanced dosha, sama agni, balanced agni, samadhatu, properly formed tissues, malakriyaha, proper elimination of malas or those three, you know, waste products, prasanna, blissful, what is blissful? Atma, soul, indriya, senses. Not like I'm going to eat a chocolate cake, kind of blissful, right? I'm satisfied with this high prana meal in a small portion size. I'm, 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 I'm blissful, right? Manaha, mind. Swasta, health. Iti abhidyate. This we call healthy. Yeah? Samadosha, sama agnishya, samadatu malakriyaha. Prasanna atma indriya manaha. Swasta iti abhidyate. Right? A little more holistic, right? How does Ayurveda work? So this slide is going to give you the differences between Ayurveda and conventional system of medicine. Not putting conventional system of medicine down, right? We all may have, most of us could have, may have benefited from Western medicine. It works great for emergency situation, critical care, right? But it is not a preventive health care, right? It is a disease care, symptomatic relief. So these are the differences between Ayurveda and conventional system of medicine. Ayurveda treats underlying cause of disease, not just the symptoms, right? Whereas Western medicine treats just the symptoms. Ayurveda treats the whole person, not just the body part, okay? It's holistic also in another sense because it's body, mind, and spirit medicine, not just the physical body. It's customized, right? Because each and every one of us is unique according to the doshik lens of constitution, right? So when you go to an Ayurveda practitioner, they will give you recommendations based on your constitution and what's right for you may not be right for someone else. So this is where we say, you know, Dr. Mark Halpern, who's the founder of California College of Ayurveda, and I know he comes here quite often, right? He says nothing is good for everyone and something is good for someone. So there's no grand pronouncement. So I, I don't know if the woman who asked me about coffee is here today, but I, yeah, yeah. So my first thing was, it depends, right? Or not everybody should be drinking kombucha, you know? Not everybody should have the latest fad. Uh, not everybody should be using coconut oil. You know, vata types would do better using sesame or almond oil. So this is where we want to find out if it's good for me, you know? So it's truly, truly customized. Not a one-size-fits-all approach, which is what Western medicine is. And most important, Ayurveda empowers the patient. Remember I said, as a, as a Ayurveda practitioner, I'm just talking the talk. I'll give all the tools, I'll support my client, but they are walking the walk. They are empowered. Just like I was empowered when I worked with my Ayurveda practitioner to take, take charge of my health. And it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's something you do constantly, day in and day out. But it's a joyful way of living. More importantly, it's a mindful way of living. Okay. So Thomas Edison, in addition to um, inventing the light bulb, this was way back in 1908. This is what he said. The doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. That's Ayurveda. Unfortunately, Western medicine is not that, right? Okay, this is Ayurveda. And here you have a very telling slide about Western medicine. This comes from Voltaire. 
And again, I think back then, they're mostly men were doctors, which is why you see men, not women, you know, in the, in the quotes. But doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little, to cure diseases of which they know less, in human beings of whom they know nothing, right? So that may be a little harsh, but that's why you have side effects and then a medication for the side effect and so on and so forth, right? And there are so many good documentaries that talk about it, right? There's uh, Food Inc. And I was just talking to somebody, you know, What the Health? It's a great documentary. What the Health? Yeah. It shows about the, uh, the unhealthy. Um, you guys have heard about it? Yeah? Yeah? OK. Somebody's seen it? Yeah. Yeah, it talks about the unhealthy nexus of the pharmaceutical industry with uh, the American Cancer Association, with the American Diabetes Association. Yeah, and also the livestock industry and the egg industry. So on the Diabetic Association page, they'll have recipes for eggs or worse. Um, yeah, and it's being subsidized, subsidized by the US government, right? Like corn gets amazing subsidies. But if you're a broccoli farmer, you won't get one penny in subsidies. You know, sugar, you get subsidies. So, you know, we've gotten to a system where it's become, uh, you know, profit-driven, right? Profit-driven. Ayurveda is holistic, right? So, like I said, we use the five senses to heal ourselves. Sense of taste, sense of smell, sight, hearing, and touch. And I already spoke about this, right? Also, the kinds of yoga a person should be doing, the asanas they should be doing based on their dosha. Kind of meditation, pranayama. Well, somebody who has a lot of prana, First, they need to ground, build dojas before they do pranayam. That's why alternate nostril breathing is tridoshic. Everybody can do it, right? Okay. And then finally, panchakarma, which are purification therapies and rasayana therapy. So whole protocol, you know, that can vary from like, you know, two weeks to like oh, three months protocol, depending on a person's constitution, the level of toxicity they have, right? And what their goals are, right? What their symptoms are, right? an entire protocol of panchakarma and rejuvenation therapies. So truly, truly holistic, okay? So now let's get into the Ayurveda basics, right? And I'm just gonna touch upon these right now and tomorrow we're gonna deep dive into this. If you were to look at the knowledge of Ayurveda, you know, think of it as a pyramid and at the base you have elements. Okay, we have to understand the Pancha Mahabhutas, the five great elements with the sages, which the ancients discovered is in every one of us because all of these elements are present in nature and we are part of nature. There's a beautiful poem in the Upanishads. I'm going to show you that in a second, right? We are the microcosm of macrocosm, that is nature. These five great elements I'm going to talk about, you know, how they manifest in our bodies and our minds in a second. But each of these elements have unique qualities. And that's important to know. And I'll tell you why, again, in, in a couple of seconds. But these five great elements, along with their unique qualities, combine in pairs to form the three great doshas. Everybody talks about doshas. Everybody knows doshas, right? But... Not everybody understands the elements, so we're kind of peeling the onion back a little bit, if so to speak, okay? Is that clear? Yeah? Okay. So, pancha mahabhutas, right? Pancha meaning five, maha meaning great, bhutas meaning elements, five great elements, right? So, the sages saw this in nature, and we are part of nature, man and woman, we are part of nature, so they said they are present in each and every one of us. That's something I want to say at the outset. Many of us, before we understood what Ayurveda was, may have taken Ayurveda questionnaires. What's your dosha? And then those are very one-sided. So it might just say, oh, you're, you know, you might say, oh, I'm vata. Well, OK, maybe that's your predominant uh, dosha that's out of balance, or maybe that's your personality. But bottom line is, we need these five elements to survive. We need three doshas to survive. What's unique to each and every one of us is the proportion of the elements and doshas. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So what are the Pancha Mahabhutas, right? From subtle to the grossest or densest, 
Um, we have ether, air, fire, water, and earth. Okay? Here's the beautiful poem in the Upanishads I was talking about, translated in English. Upanishads are a collection of ancient Vedic texts. Right? Okay? As is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, so is the cosmic mind. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. As is the atom, so is the universe. Okay? This has been confirmed by modern science. Right? Modern astrophysics says we're all made up of stardust. 97% of everything in the universe is common. In fact, the first episode of Cosmos, how many of you know about the episode of Cosmos, what I'm talking about? Yes. The first episode ends with this quote saying, we're all made up of stardust. In fact, an astrophysicist and a pathologist from the Stanford University have combined together because they're husband and wife, and they have written a book with the stars, how the human body is connected to the life cycles of the Earth, the planets, and the stars. So I just discovered it today. So I haven't read the book, but I'm excited. So I wanted to share. It says galaxies have about 97% of the same kind of atoms that we humans have. Right, and these rishis, these sages discovered it long time ago without telescopes. Maybe they had telescopes, I don't know, but they discovered it. So, and now you see a lot of things are being confirmed by modern science. Wow, digestion is so important in Ayurveda. Well, modern science is confirming that, right? So you're seeing a lot of confirmation of these, of these ancient um, wisdom. So what are the five great elements, right? How do they manifest in, in us? Okay, very quickly. Ether is space. Ether is the idea of space. So wherever we have space in our bodies, i.e. cavities, our entire digestive system, right? Our respiratory system, our nasal passages, our ear canal, that's how sound travels through it, right? Those are examples of presence of ether in a physical body. Metaphorically speaking, ether is, represents our connection to consciousness, okay? When you sit in meditation, like, you know, you were talking about Brahman, there is no physical manifestation, per se, right? So, air is governed with movement. Anywhere there's movement in the body. Where's, where's mov movement in the body? Everywhere. Nervous system, circulation, right? So, the beating of your heart, the blinking of your eyes, right? All of those movements are governed by the principle of air, okay? Fire, what about in the mind? Air governs the movement of thought, okay? Thought. Fire is responsible for digestion and transformation. We have about 30 tri trillion cells in our bodies. Right now, to maintain homeostasis, to keep us alive, there's chemical and metabolic reactions taking place in those cells, right? The digestion we are most concerned about in Ayurveda is the digestion in our digestive system, Agni, okay? In Ayurveda, you, it's not just you are what you eat, it's you are how you digest, okay? Digestion is the cornerstone of health and immunity. What about the mind? As I am talking to you here, you are paying attention and digesting the information. So the fire helps us digest information, thoughts, impressions, right? Um, help, gives us the power of discrimination. Water, we are uh, 75 to 80% water. Um, water lubricates us, protects us. It's the mucous membranes lining the sensitive organs. It's the cerebrospinal fluid. It's the synovial membranes and the synovial fluid lining our joints, right? So that we're mostly made up of water. And then earth is the structure that you see. This is what gives us stability and structure, okay? Oh, water on the emotional side represents contentment and love. Earth on the emotional side represents being stable, being grounded, not having our head in the clouds, so to speak, okay? Each of these elements have specific qualities or gunas associated with it. And this is important to understand because I'm going to get to the principle of Ayurveda healing in a bit here, okay? The ancients discovered 20 
gunas or qualities in 10 pairs of opposites. For our understanding, it's enough if we know the four. Hot versus cold, heavy versus light, moist versus dry, static versus mobile, okay? So now let's marry the elements with their gunas, okay? Ether, think of a bucket of ether. Is it gonna be heavy or light? It's gonna be light, it's space basically. It's everything you don't see but connects us, right? So ether is light. All elements except fire are cold, so ether is cold. And ether is dry, all elements except water are dry. So ether is light, cold, and dry, okay? Air is light, cold, dry, and mobile. This is what makes air a mischief maker. We, in Southern California, we have wildfires and the meteorologists are always watching for the movement of the wind, the direction of the wind, unpredictable. This is why vata dosha, which has air in it, is the king of doshas. This mobile quality makes it a mischief maker, okay? Fire is hot. It's also light and dry, but it's hot. That's the most important quality I want you to remember. Water is heavy and moist. Think of a bucket of water. It's heavy and water is moist, okay? It's not fire, so it's cold. And earth, think of a bucket of earth, heavier, right? Heavy, cold, and dry. So good so far, so far so good. This is important because these pancha mahabhutas make up doshas and we want to understand the qualities. Why is that? So first of all, let me tell you, if you have, we have all these elements present in us, some of us may, may have more of one element than other. You know, some of us may have more ether, some of us may have four, so more fire and so on and so forth. Understand that when elements are in balance, they do beautiful things. It's only when they are imbalanced, i.e. too much of an element, that's when you have symptoms. I'm gonna give you a quick example. Too much of ether can make a person spacey and distracted, ungrounded. Too much of air can make a person very worried or cause constipation in the colon, dryness. Too much of fire can give a person acidity or heartburn, especially if they eat spicy foods, or a person can become angry or judgmental. Too much of water can lead to water retention or swelling or edema. And too much of water on the emotional side can make us overly attached and overly emotional to people and things. Too much earth can make us overweight. Too much earth and the mind can make us very stubborn. So the groundedness now becomes very stubborn. We become couch potatoes, okay? Does that, does that help a little more, clarify? Okay. Why is this important? All of the principles of Ayurveda healing rests on this simple yet very profound point here, which is like increases like and opposites are the cure for each other, okay? So as an example of like increases like, you know, eating a spicy hot Indian meal for lunch on a hot summer day. Like today, if you were to eat a hot, and especially if you have a lot of fire in you, you're gonna feel warm, you're gonna feel intense, you're gonna feel judgmental, you're probably going to have some heartburn or something, like burning indigestion, right? So like increases like and opposites are the cure for opposites. Actually, Hippocrates coined that, and you know, you find a lot of Ayurveda knowledge mixed in with, which is the foundation of Greek medicine, actually. So a lot of reference to Ayurvedic plants as well. So opposites are the cure for opposites. That's what Hippocrates said. Example, so having a nicely spiced, you know, ginger, nutmeg, sweet potato soup on a cold night in winter, it's gonna be balancing. Make sense, yeah? It's so important, it deserves its own special slide, okay? So opposites are the cure for opposites. This is fundamental Ayurveda, right? So this is where you become very mindful if you're feeling ungrounded, you know? Don't start your day with Pop-Tarts or toast. Start your day with a bowl of oatmeal. If you're feeling really hot and intense, you know, cool yourself with some coconut water and cucumber salad, right? Don't go for Indian, spicy Indian food, right? Okay, this is where you can put this knowledge to work. You know, if you're feeling it's cold and clammy and it's rainy and you're feeling heavy and sluggish, well, have a, you know, nicely spiced light soup 
right? Maybe, you know, do some asanas, right? So, okay, this is how you maybe do some kapal bhati, wake you up, right? This is how you put it into practice, okay? So the five great elements combine in pairs to form the three great doshas. Vata, pitta, and kapa, not kapha, kapa, okay? Kapa. In my language, actually, kabam means mucus. You'll see, it's made up of water and earth, and mucusy conditions are predominantly kapha in nature, okay? Vata, you've heard kapha, right? Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Vata, pitta, kapha, okay? Again, know that we have this present in us at all times. What is unique is the proportion, right? Proportion that's present in each and every one of us. Vata is a combination of air and ether. So you should be thinking, oh, lightest of elements, cold, hmm, dry, mobile. Pitta is mostly fire, a little bit of water, okay? And I'll talk about some imbalances where you'll see the water imbalance, but most of the imbalances of pitta are one of fire, heat. And kappa is made up of earth and water, okay? Vata, so fall is actually vata time. So fall is represented in the picture. Fall is vata time. So if you're a vata person or vata predominates in your constitution during fall, you have to take even more care of your vata. Does that make sense? If you're pitta, you need to take care of your pitta even more in summer. And for kappa, if you live in a cold climate and if it's rainy and snowy, you're going to have to take more care of your, um, you know, kappa so that you don't, like, hibernate like a bear, right? So, so vata, right? Vat, now we're going to talk about vata. Vata governs movement. Think vata movement, okay? Even though it's a combination of air and ether, right? I said air, ether is responsible for cavities, but air is more responsible for movement, right? All nerve impulses, circulation, respiration, all governed by principle of vata, okay? So what are the qualities? Ether plus air. Light, cold, dry, mobile. Don't forget the mobile quality. This is what makes vata the king of doshas. According to Charaka Samhita, 80% of all diseases, all imbalances are caused by vata dosha. So what does this mean? Those of you who have more vata in your constitution have to work harder to manage your imbalances and build ojas or immunity, right? This is where it's not a one size fits all. Kappa types are blessed with great immunity. They don't have to do much. They have to uh, make sure they don't get lifestyle diseases by adopting a couch potato diet and lifestyle. But for vata types, they have to work harder because it's, a, it's air and ether are very light, depleting, right? Okay, so they have to take more care. So also, what are the physical characteristics? Not to stereotype, but you know, again, as an Ayurveda practitioner, I never, so if somebody asks me, okay, what dosha predominates in me, I'll have some idea, but not the full idea. And we, I'm a firm believer in the fact that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And it is, right? Okay. So as an Ayurveda practitioner, I, what goes into me assessing uh, one's constitution is of course physical evaluation, but also functional history, personality characteristics, evaluation of tongue, evaluation of pulse. It's much more holistic. But this will give you an idea, okay, starting point, okay? So because all of these light qualities predominate, a vata, typical vata has a small build, very tall or very short, tendency to have dry skin, hair and nails, long neck, long features, everything is longer, Oval face, smaller eyes, so smaller features, more delicate features, okay? And some examples. So vata body type, more boyish uh, body type, and you see some famous vata people you have, like, uh, you know, uh, Woody Allen, who has, like, this nervous energy about him. Um, you have a ballerina, you have Fred Astaire, who's a dancer, right? And you have um, Audrey Hepburn, who's, like, you know, maybe you know, very slim-waisted, size zero actress, so, yeah. Here are my pics, yeah? So you have, like, you know, you have this actress who's very slim, and then you have this actress here in the center who has, like, delicate features, and then you have this guy, actor with, like, a very long, like, oval face, you know, like a vata face, okay? According to the ancient text, this is the vata archetype. 
the butterfly that flits from flower to flower gathering nectar. So vata types are always like, you know, they get bored easily, you know, they need excitement, you know, so they're moving from project to project and when not in balance, they haven't finished even one project. They're going from, you know, place to place and depleting themselves because, you know, they, they just like to, they like the butterfly, you know, so, or, or the bumblebee, never a dull moment, okay? Functionally, if you have a lot of vata in you, um, you know, you're going to have variable appetite. Okay, they're the natural born um, artist. It's the creative one, right? So this could be the artist who time passes, it's four o'clock and he or she realizes they've not had even a meal, like, you know, and now they are hungry. And so now they're going to polish off a big burrito or something like that. So it's feast or famine, right? Um, they don't have routines when not in balance. This is why for vata types, they have to have routines, especially around meal times, to ground them. So poor digestion, because of that, tendency towards gas and constipation. Constipation, ha hallmark of vata imbalance in the colon, which is the main home of vata. Sleep lightly, difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying, staying asleep. They speak very fast sometimes ramble, so, you know, first sentence is about one subject, the second sentence is about totally different subject, they've moved on, okay. Um, cold extremities, especially feeling very cold, um, hands and feet, they prefer warm, warm and tropical climates because of that. Psychologically, they're creative, artistic, adaptable, they make excellent psychics and clairvoyants because they have a lot of ether, they're very compassionate, they make excellent healers as well. Okay, they're like the life of the party. Okay, like the social butterfly. Okay, chief location, each of the dosha has its main location in the digestive system for vata, it's colon, which is why gas, constipation, especially is vata imbalance. Other locations are bones and nervous system. All nervous system disorders are vata in nature. Osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, which affects the bones, are vata in nature. Chief symptom is pain because they're very delicate nervous system. And digestive system is gas and constipation. Other imbalances. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but gives you an idea. Gas, bloating, or constipation on the digestive side, on the physical side, arthritis, insomnia, chronic fatigue, dry skin, propping joints, cold extremities, all nervous system disorders and tics and tremors, excess movement caused by too much vata. Again, imbalance means too much, vata in excess. Emotionally, this makes us very creative and artistic, but when there's too much, we become ungrounded, we become fearful, we become anxious, we become worried. We may have insomnia, thoughts keeping us up or thoughts waking us up in the middle of the night. We don't have the ability to make decisions or finish projects, okay? So in a nutshell, how do you balance vata? Well, remember that uh, principle of Ayurveda healing, opposites are the cure for opposites. So if too much vata means is too much light, cold, dry, mobile, bring in the opposite. Nourishing, warming, grounding foods. We're going to look at a va what a vata plate should look like in our Ayurveda nutrition workshop. Okay? Grounding stable routines. Everything should be on time and on routine to keep vata in check, ex especially meal times. Daily abhyanga, self-massage with warm oil, with heavy oil like sesame and almond. Cultivating faith is the ultimate antidote for fear. Right? So cultivating faith is very, very important. And this can be, you know, for, it's, it's sometimes difficult for people who are not raised in a certain faith or who don't believe in God, right? So start small, you know, maybe nature is your God. Maybe have a God box, you know, where you write down all your worries, you know, have an altar. I'm a firm believer of having an altar in your home with some images of your deities that you love uh, and maybe some things from nature like beautiful seashells or pine cones right, and have, have uh, like a God boy, because Vata types are so worried that affects even their sleep. So write down all your worries and put it, offer it to the universe, right? But the altar can be like an anchor. So cultivating faith is the antidote to too much Vata in the mind, okay? Pitta is mostly fire, okay, right? And a little bit of water. 
the only time the water manifests is like when somebody has very oily acne. So it's lots of heat, it's the redness and the heat of pitta, and you see that oiliness of pitta as well, right? So pitta, think fire, think heat. Responsible for transformation, metabolism, digestion, okay? Qualities, think hot and sharp. In fact, if you're predominant pitta, go check your tongue tonight. Chances are your tongue is sharp, pointed. That's one of the indicators of pitta. And sometimes when you're not in balance, you can even speak sharply. Too much pitta, right? So pitta, everything is medium. Medium build, good musculature. You know, uh, face has some angles to it. It could be high cheekbones, protruding chin. We look at examples, deep set eyes. Has an intensity. Vata is more delicate. Pitta is more intense, more passionate. Okay. So some pictures. You have President Kennedy, you know, you don't get to be president unless you have fire in you, right? Okay. Um, you have and the actress Nicole Kidman, see, she has like high cheekbones. You have Jack Nicholson, so, who usually gets mad, so, at basketball games, so. Here's the Pitta archetype. Oh, bull. It's not the butterfly, it's the bull, right? It's, and when not in balance, bull in a china shop, right? Okay. They're the natural born leaders, okay? They are blessed with strong appetite, okay? They, they won't miss a meal. The term hangry, have you heard of hangry? Yeah, hungry plus angry, that was invented for a pitta type that misses a meal. If you're a pitta, you don't wanna miss a meal. If you're around a pitta, you wanna feed them first, okay? Regular bowel movements, sometimes two to three times a day, that's okay for them. Good sleepers, they might wake up, but they'll fall asleep. Very direct speakers, okay? There's no wishy-washy. They'll tell you what's on their mind, okay? Low tolerance for hot weather. Psychological, like I said, natural born leaders, very intelligent, confident, courageous, very charismatic, okay? Uh, they make great teachers. Organized, focused, and a strong sense of discernment, strong sense of right or wrong, okay? Chief location, a small intestine. Again, they're blessed with great appetite, but if they eat spicy foods, if they eat very hot foods, if they don't in eat enough food, if they eat very sour tasting foods, they are going to aggravate their agni too much, and that's gonna cause burning indigestion, okay? All of those burning indigestion, acidity, diarrhea, acid reflux. Other locations of pitta is blood, eyes, skin, and liver. Storehouse of fire, okay? Chief symptom is feeling is fever or feeling warm, okay? Pitta in excess leads to, we saw all the digestive burning indigestion. What about on the physical side? Anywhere there's reddening of eyes, conjunctivitis, or skin, eczema, acne, right? Certain forms of psoriasis, rosacea, Buildup of heat in specific organs, so cirrhosis, jaundice of liver, skin rashes, ulcers, infection, inflammation, anything that ends with itis, gingivitis, inflammation of the gums, ulcerative colitis, inflammation of colon. So modern day lifestyle has led us to live in chronic state of stress, which leads to inflammation. That is why we want to embrace the ultimate anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle, which is yoga, which is meditation, which is Ayurveda, right? Emotionally, when there's too much fire, we become very angry, very critical, very judgmental, very aggressive. So we know pitta is hot, so how do you balance pitta? Cooling foods, cooling grains, vegetables. So we'll talk about this more at the nutrition workshop. Juicy fruits. I always say favor the top three C's, cucumber, coconut, and cilantro, liberally in summer, especially if you're pitta, very cooling foods, okay? Um, I wrote an article for the Chopra Center. I write articles from, for them time to time on the blog. You can check it out. I wrote a cooling summer cookbook with some recipes, so which follows the protocol for pitta. Calming practices, everything in moderation. Daily massage, loving themselves with cooler oils like sunflower and coconut. 
and cultivating non-judgment. It's easier said than done, but being very mindful whenever the mind judges. Good with pitta? Finally, kapha. Earth and water, right? This is what gives us stability. This is what moisturizes us and lubricates us, right? Protects us, gives us immunity. Now a bucket of earth and water is basically a bucket of mud. So it's heavy, cold, moist, and dense, okay? So the biggest of body types, heavy build, big broad frame, thick, big features, big teeth, big nails, okay? So here are some examples. Of course, please understand that both Martin Luther King and Oprah also had a fair amount of pitta to accomplish what they accomplish, but more from the body type. And then here are my picks, right? Okay. Natural bond supporters. Okay. So more bigger and round face is indicative of kapha dosha. Kapha archetype, the slow moving elephant or the turtle, right? No hurry to get anywhere. Again, I think I was talking to somebody at lunch and she said, my husband is a kappa, your rock, you know, very stable, very supportive. They're the natural born supporters. Because there's too much water in earth, sluggish appetite, not hungry upon waking up. For kappa types, don't eat breakfast first thing in the morning. Eat only when you're hungry, okay? Good bowel movements, maybe only one per day. Love to sleep and speech pattern is very slow and deliberate. They won't speak, they will observe. If they have to speak, it's very little. Psychologically, very patient, calm, loyal, and gentle, devoted listeners. Main um, home is stomach, upper part of stomach, and then respiratory system. So this is why uh, swelling, which is water retention, too much water is one of the main, re main um, indications of too much kappa, but more importantly, Digestive imbalances, nausea, not hungry upon waking up, sluggish digestion, lack of appetite, heavy and sleepy after eating are the main imbalances. Other imbalances on the physical side, again, blessed with great immunity, but if they eat the standard American diet, which is the SAD diet, and adopt a couch potato lifestyle, they're going to get lifestyle diseases like obesity, diabetes, excess mucus production, some types of asthma, low thyroid function, excessive sleep, water retention. In the mind, they become greedy, very stubborn, complacent, lethargy, tend to hold on things and people, okay, and depressed. So keys to balance kappa in a nutshell, bring in the opposite. It's heavy, dense, moist. Bring drying, light, pungent foods and spices, portion control with your meals. Stimulating massage with very light oils, warming oils like safflower or mustard or dry brushing. Stimulating practices like, you know, Ashtanga yoga would be excellent, sun salutations, um, cultivating non-attachment, volunteering, giving up of things and giving up of time. So in closing, thank you so much. I think I went like uh, eight minutes over. I'd like to end with this wonderful affirmation of healing from the Rig Veda, which is one of the most ancient Vedas, right? So it says, I move with the infinite in nature's power, and I hold, you hold, each one of us holds the fire of the soul, and we all hold life and healing. So remember, remember the ultimately, the inner healer, Lord Danvantri, is within you. So, so more to come. This was one of six, so more to come. So thank you so much. <laughs> Namaste.